Thank you, Kelvin, for leading us in prayer. Um, appreciate it. It's great as a group of people to have corporate prayer. Our God listens to us. He's powerful, and he wants to uh, be involved in our week. And so it's great to individually pray and then corporately pray. Um, good morning, everyone. If you don't know, I'm Hayden. Um, I get the chance to work here with the other staff members and all the volunteers that um, Calvin's just prayed for. Uh, without our volunteers, we wouldn't have all the worship and the PowerPoint. Um, so thank you for the volunteers too. I hope you're recovering from your Christmas break. Um, hope you uh, behaved yourself. I didn't. I ate way too much chocolate. Um, and I was just thinking, oh, I don't eat so much chocolate. And Easter's coming up. So I'm like, oh, no, Easter's coming up too. So I haven't applied the wisdom that I should have to my life, but hopefully Easter I will get in and involve the wisdom I should be applying. The last couple of weeks in New Zealand has been really hot. Uh, my car thermometer said it was 37 degrees, the air temperature, which is hot. Apparently on Friday, it was 33 degrees in Christchurch Airport and 27 degrees point one in the Auckland Airport. So it's been really hot the last couple of weeks. Um, Who's ever heard that phrase that goes this, only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun? Who's heard that? Okay, the rest of you, you need to get a life. <laughs> Who has not heard that statement? Okay, wow, okay. Um, apparently it was written by uh, uh, Joseph Kibling, who wrote The Jungle Book. And Joseph grew up in India like Audrey Burt. Um, he went back to England for a few years, but he mo lived most of his life in England. And he noticed the English people were terrible. They'd go out in the midday sun. <laughs> And obviously the wisdom is to go out in the morning, come back, sit in the air conditioning during the daytime, have a siesta, and then go out in the afternoon. And so that's a bit of wisdom that we should apply, particularly the last couple of days. And maybe, hopefully next week we can apply this wisdom too. Today we're going to continue in our series, and we're going to look at a psalm um, from the words of the heart. And this psalm is about a wisdom psalm. And so today we're going to consider wisdom. Together. So if you've got your Bible, I'm reading from the ESV. You can read from any translation you want to, NIV, North Island Version, or Nearly Inspired Version, or the ESV, whatever version you want to, want to use, you can. I do like the NIV. It's a really good translation. Okay, so let's move into it. Got your Bibles? I'm going to read all six verses for us. Verse 1. Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked not stand in judgment, nor sinners in, in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. So Psalm 1 has been acknowledged as a wisdom psalm. So today we're going to consider this wisdom psalm. And you'll see many of the, the type of features of wisdom in this psalm. John Walton suggests that 21 of the 150 psalms are wisdom psalms. So as you go through the book of Psalms, as you are right now reading through 150 of them, 21 of them will actually be wisdom psalms. It's like any piece of work. Um, a text has a particular genre um, that it is uh, speaking about. For example, one of my favorite genres to read is actually autobiographies. Not, auto, not biographies, but autobiographies. I just love them for recreational reading. To read about someone else's life. Who likes autobiographies? Yes, there's more hands. Then, okay, cool, wonderful. So you might not identify uh, the type of genre when you pick up that autobiography, but it does influence the way you read about it. It influences the way you expect it to unfold. And so um, same with the psalm. This is a wisdom psalm. It has particular characteristics that you will see if you understand wisdom that will come up time and time again. Now, there is flexibility um, when you look at different types of work. It doesn't solely fit just into wisdom, like an autobiography. You might get a bit of wisdom from an autobiography, but the main genre, the main type, is actually autobiography. The book of Proverbs, if you read the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs generally is wisdom literature. As you read through, you see it's classified as wisdom literature. It devotes a lot of time to the wicked, the wise, the foolish, and the righteous, and the, and the, and the good person. And it does this contrasts and also the comparisons, and then the consequences that happen. And so as you read through it, you have this like jumble mess of contrasts, and, and it's quite difficult to memorize because it's, it goes back and forth and back and forth. 
And that's what we're going to read through as we look at Psalm 1. So first of all, um, just quickly, what is wisdom and its purpose? Well, obviously wisdom, Proverbs chapter 1 verse 2 tells us, to know wisdom, to know instruction, to understand words of insight. So when we read wisdom, it gives us insight. Wisdom is actually quite a rich word. Um, it can't be easily summarized. It has a, a lot of depth to it. Um, Longman, Temple, he uses these words to describe it, and I found it quite helpful. It's wisdom is to how to navigate life successfully. And I've got a picture there of a guy drawing through a maze. Life is a maze. It has many corners and turns. We have to turn left or right. And so it's, it's the ability to navigate through successfully. It's the skill of living. To gain wisdom, it's, which is the ability to navigate through life, which is pretty cool. And of course, the Bible has a word for this. If you're able to navigate life, then you're called the wise person. So it's a practical knowledge that helps you uh, to how to act, what to avoid, how to respond to situations, how to get out of situations, how not to be in situations. And so it's pretty cool. I also found John Walton's um, diagram quite helpful. He's got a diagram, and he calls wisdom order. And in ancient times, uh, including Israel, they saw wisdom as order. The world has an order. God created the world with order. There's order in relationships. And the idea of wisdom is to, to find out order, to seek order, what that order would be. And of course, for Christians and for the Israelites reading the Bible, we know the beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord brings wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. And so when you have that jigsaw piece of puzzle in the middle, God, and you know who God is, and you know his characteristics, then you can have wisdom. If God is about truthfulness, then how do you do government and law? By truthfulness. How do you do ethics? By truthfulness. How do you do family and society? You're truthful. Um, what about the world that you live in? Gravity is truthful. It's always on. You trust gravity because it's truthful towards you. And so you look at order. Whereas not to be wise is to, to follow chaos, to, to lie, to cheat, to, to break things down. And so that's a basic understanding of wisdom. So with that little bit of framework in mind, let's look at our psalm. The first thing we notice in our psalm is that is the word blessed. The first word is blessed, which gets our attention, and it's a great place to start. While the biblical word blessed is not normally a part of our speech, you don't go around at university and go, oh, I've had a blessed week, or at work, you say to your boss, oh, it's a blessed job I have. It's not a kind of a word we use, but the concept behind this word is a word we use all the time. We use this concept every time. Um, we understand this word to be kind of like a happiness. And so we use it in our sports, in our weeks, in our, uh, in our conversations of politics. If you type into Google the word happiness or blessed, it comes with, with hundreds of books on diets, fitness, you know, philosophies, uh, gurus, spiritual gurus. And so happiness is a, a blessedness is a, is a concept that we value, that we look for. Now, unfortunately, in English translation, struggle to translate the word, um, the Hebrew word that's behind this English word blessed. It's a, re a rich Hebrew word. Not only that, but actually Hebrew has different words in Hebrew for blessed. And we use the one English word for a number of Hebrew different words. And so that makes it a bit more foggy too. So every time you read the word blessed, ask yourself which one of these Hebrew words it is. Kind of like the word Lord. There are different words for Lord in Hebrew, and we just translate all of them as Lord. But they are different. This one is not the dominant word in Hebrew. Uh, this word appears 44 times. There are other words for blessed that occur more. But interestingly enough, it occurs 26 times in Psalms, which is the majority. Seven times in Proverbs, once in Job, once in Daniel, and twice in Isaiah. So 40, uh, 46, uh, 26 times in Psalms, this word blessed appears. Now, the NLT, which is the New Living Translator, uses the word joy. Who has the NLT Bible? Okay, a couple of hands. You'll notice in your text says the word joy, which is actually quite a good translation. It helps you understand that the word blessed actually involves your emotions. It's actually something that's really deep inside you. It also uses the, word, uh, uses the word plural, joys. The original Hebrew word is actually plural. We have in our English text, blessed, the singular. It's kind of hand, hard to translate the plural. You know, blessedness is the man. So they often use the word blessed. Okay? So joys. If you have the NCV, uh, New Century Translation, it uses the word happy. Who's got happy in their Bible? 
Okay, a couple. Okay. Which Bible do you have? Okay, so a couple of you have the word happy, and that's also a good translation for this word. If we put it in the plural, it would be happinesses. Um, the other one, the message, who has the message Bible? No one has the message Bible? Okay, we've got one. Okay, it's good. It's a good Bible. It's, a, it's more of a paraphrase than a translation. It says, how well must God like you? Now, here's the idea of being jealous in a good way of this person, but also how well God likes you. The idea that blessing actually comes from God. Generally, it's always tied in with God. And so when you're blessed, it's from linked in with God himself, which is cool. A. Anderson says, how rewarding is the life? Um, uh, Hamilton says this, oh, the blessed person. So it's quite a deep word, hard to translate, but I think as you look at the 26, you get an idea that this is a really deep, um, beautiful word. Um, now, the idea of blessed is not sort of always happy in our understanding in the English world. Sometimes things are hard in life, and yet you're still blessed, you're still happy. For example, when God disciplines you, how do you feel? You don't go around, oh, it's really good, God's disciplining me this week, right? You feel quite miserable, but at the same time, you are actually blessed because you have a God who loves you, who cares enough about you that he chases you and he disciplines you. So you can be blessed even when you're not feeling like so happy, happy. Um, which is cool. So, for our time together, I'm going to use the word happy with a capital H to talk about um, this concept. Um, later on the psalm, the word happy, the person who's happy, is identified as the righteous person. So just giving a heads up on that. So, the happy person is who we're going to talk about. So, what can we learn about this happy person? First of all, the happy person is described here in the text. Um, firstly, negatively three times, and if I was writing a sermon, I usually would put the positive first, but the scriptures talk about the negative first, and then it gives us two positives, the not, nor, nor, but, and and, which is pretty cool. And I guess the idea here is it's contrasting it so that when we get to the positive, we can see the positive so clearly because we see what we're not supposed to do, which is pretty cool. The word blessed, um, it always means that a person has to do something. You're not just blessed by doing nothing. Usually you usually have to do something positively or negatively. So here in our wisdom psalm, we're going to see the negative three times and then the positive two times. So let's look at the negative um, first of all. We see here that the happy person's counsel, the advice that they follow for their life, is not from the wicked. It's not from the sinner, not from the scoffer. And so we see an illustration in Proverbs chapter 1 where we have this young man and the, guy, the, the father says, do not go with the other young men that want to steal and take other people's lives and steal their money. He says, because God can see everything. And so we have an illustration of this, of following the counsel of somebody else, because in the end, you will lose your own life. And so this young man is asked to join the street gang and to steal and to hurt other people, and in the end, he gets hurt himself. And this idea of wisdom is this. Bad, uh, uh, bad counsel always robs you of the very thing it promises you. So bad counsel robs you of the very thing you, it promises you. So you're looking to steal money to get money and take other people's lives, and in the end it takes your money and your life, which is sad. So you've got counsel. Now notice here that the psalm is a progression. You'll see here it says walk, stand, and sit in the council. So to walk means to hang around with people who have corrupt counsel to follow the advice, to listen to them. Then we have stand. And stand means that you take uh, their counsel into consideration, that you apply it to your life. Uh, you share their way of life. It suggests that you're not just making a mistake, like, oh, I made a mistake. I killed someone. But actually, you have embraced it. It's no longer a, a, a mistake, but a habit that you follow in your life. And then finally, we have the word seat. And when you sit, it's when you teach. Jesus sat down in the Sermon on the Mount to teach. It's the idea that you're teaching it, you're teaching the corruption, that you are mocking other people who follow it. You are mocking people who follow God's ways. And so there's this progression um, from just hanging around to moving down. Now, over the last 200 years, um, it's not hard to see people who have mocked God. Uh, particularly now, we live in a world uh, that's called post-Christianity. But in the West, we've seen people who have mocked God. Over the last 200 years, we've seen people say, 
History has shown us, research has shown us, the Bible is inaccurate. They say there's many cities in the Bible that don't exist today. If you read through the Bible, they name these cities, and we can't find them. And then later on, people die who have complained about these cities not existing, and then we find them. Some guy digs up the city, and it's got the name, the same name that's in the Bible. And so the Bible's often proven itself to be historical reliable. Even though our modern scholars don't know where these cities are, they dig them up, and the Bible's always found to be right. Also, our ethics, today's ethics, um, people say the Bible's ethics are out of date for relationships or for work, and we need to create a new ethics system, which is just old ethics, corrupt ethics brought back into today's world. And yet the Bible has always got the perfect ethics for us to follow. So a question for you to reflect on is this. What are some of the human-centered uh, counsels that you hear today? At work, in movies, in stories? What are some of those things that you hear today? Secondly, we read the counsel from the creator, the Lord. These are the positive ones. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. He meditates on it. Just two times, day and night. What does meditation mean? Well, meditation is not about transmeditation, where a person tries to empty their mind, turn their brain off, turn their feelings off. In the Bible, it's actually the opposite. It's where you turn your mind on, when you turn your feelings on, when you start to think about what the text is about. And it's not just thinking about positive thinking. It's actually thinking about God's word. Reading a portion of God's word, not um, how to be happy, but God's word, and actually thinking about how does this apply to my life? Now, if you live in the Y category, you understand this, because this is the idea of, of chewing your cud, of a cow chewing. Now, if you live in the Y category, you see a cow, and it's chewing. And you come back five minutes later, and it's still chewing. And it chews, and it chews. And that's what we're supposed to be like. We're supposed to, the righteous man is supposed to chew the word of God, to read a passage and then walk with it and think, how does this apply to my work? How does this apply to my sports? How does this apply to my, my career? Which is quite cool. So the wicked and the righteous are fundamentally different in their counsel. They have fundamentally different counsel, a different way of living life with their attitudes. What are some of the clashes that you see between the counsel of the wicked and the creator? When you watch a movie, when you read a book, have you noticed the, the contrast, the clash? Now, if you say you've noticed nothing, then you need to think more and watch a movie more carefully because there's a huge contrast going on in our society. I watched a movie last night, and I could see at least four or five things of the counsel of wicked coming out. I could also see the counsel of God in that movie too. So when you watch a movie, read a book, have a listen to it. It's always there. There's always a contrast going on. It's always competing for your mind, competing for your heart. Now, a way of application here, um, considering wisdom. Where are you at? Are you walking a little bit with the counsel of the wicked? Are you standing and applying the wicked's counsel in your life? Or are you sitting? Have you rejected God? Do you tease those who follow God's ways? Or are you delighting? Are you chewing like a cow on God's word? Are you meditating on God's word? Where would you be? Now, in this photograph, the young boy has taped his sister to the wall, um, which is not the counsel that God gives you. You're supposed to love your sister or your boss or your parents. Okay, So this is the wrong counsel. So in your life, what are you applying? Where would you be on this spectrum? Anyway, this is kind of a trick question because I find myself in some areas of my life following the counsel of God. In other areas of my life, I find I'm following the counsel of the wicked. You know, sometimes in my financial life or my sports life or my relationship life, I can vary in my types of counsel that I'm following and I can find myself to be very inconsistent. Yet I know where I'm going. I know that God is going to transform my mind. And I'm not perfect, but Jesus is perfect. Um, I love Romans 12, 1. It says this, Therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing your mind. So I find myself applying different types of wisdom. And there's inconsistency, but at the same time, I can see that God is taking some of the counsel that was wrong and changing it. And the stuff that I might have seen 10 years ago that I believed, I've now had this transformation in my life. I actually see God's word more clearly. So hopefully you're on that journey as well. 
the only person who is really, truly blessed would be Jesus Christ himself. Psalms 1 actually talks about Jesus. And I'm really glad that David Burt is going to be talking about Psalms 2 in two weeks' time because it's this idea that we're talking about Jesus. The only really righteous man who lived was Jesus Christ. We see in John 1, 2, My dear children, I write to you so that you will not sin. So that's my job, not to sin. But if anyone does sin, and I make mistakes, I do. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. This is the psalm that's talking about. He is the anointing sacrifice for our sin, not only for yours, but for the whole world. And so this is pretty cool. Um, now let's move on to the second description of the happy person. The second description of the happy person, they're described by the consequences in their life. Because the wicked and the righteous follow different counsel, fundamentally they have different consequences, which is obviously no-brainer. The righteous person continues, naturally. Um, the wicked person is condemned. Naturally they come to an end. So in verse 3 we see the joyful person, symbolized by a tree. The tree re represents the righteous person who will continue, whereas the wicked person will not continue. He is like a tree, someone who's alive, who is growing, who is flourishing, who has progress, who is consistent. I went for a run yesterday, and I ran past a tree that I think I ran past when I was 15 years old. It's still there in the domain, and it's still growing. And this is the righteous person. He will remain. He'll be consistent. And then this righteous person, this happy person, has got... Uh, four descriptions. He is planted by the streams of water, yields its fruit, leaves do not wither, and whatever he does prospers. What does it mean to be planted by the streams of water? Now, in New Zealand, we get rain all the time. Even this week when it's been really hot. Who got rained on this week? Yeah. Our hottest week and we still got rained on. But back in Israel, rain didn't come very often. And rain... Uh, if it didn't rain, your trees wouldn't grow. In fact, your trees and your grass would, would die. So having water is very important. So the living streams, whether they're man-made, man carved out by the people, or a natural stream was really important. And so the tree will not grow, the tree will not survive without the living streams. So the success of the tree is not the tree in itself, but the streams of water. The tree needs to go down its roots and suck up all the water it needs. So the consequence of the righteous is that they will continue. And this will be con contrast with the wicked. Their leaves will not wither. Now what does it mean that their leaves will not wither? Does it mean it's a New Zealand tree? Because New Zealand trees are all evergreen trees. If you see a leaf that drops its leaf in New Zealand, it's not from New Zealand. Our trees don't lose their leaves. Now it's not talking about a New Zealand tree. What it's talking about is this. If you have the streams of water, then the leaves will not fall off. That's what it's talking about here. So as followers of Jesus, we know that the living streams of water, naturally we think of who? Jesus. Perfect. You've all been to Sunday school. So when we, when we think about the living streams of water, we think naturally about Jesus. John 7.37. On the last and great day, Jesus is speaking, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice. I'm not going to be a loud voice. I'll say it softly. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me to drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, quoting Isaiah, streams of living water will flow within him. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about Jesus inside us. And so as the tree of righteousness, it is the stream that gives us life. Later on, Jesus says this in John 4. When he's talking to the woman at the well, this woman is, um, has lived a life of unrighteousness, and Jesus is bringing her closer to the righteous life. And Jesus answered her, Everyone who drinks from this water will thirst again from the well. But whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water. So the psalm is talking about Jesus, the spring that we have. The tree in Bible times would not be successful without the stream of water. As Christians, we will not be successful in living the Christian life without Jesus Christ. The wisdom in the psalm is not work harder. Today, I'm going to teach you how to be righteous, be, work harder, do more work for Jesus, but actually put your roots down into the stream. The stream is what will make you grow. You are the tree. And there's a big difference. So, don't try and live the Christian life 
Give up. Put your roots down into Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes you grow. And I don't have time, but John 15, 1, that famous verse about talking about abiding in me. Remain in me and I'll remain in you. You'll produce fruit by your own efforts. No, you'll produce fruit when you abide in Jesus, which is cool. So the righteous person will continue in their life. They'll draw upon Jesus, not upon their own strength. Are you applying Jesus in your life? Are you that tree that is drawing on Jesus? Or are you trying to behave yourself? Are you trying to do all the religious things? Coming to church is a great thing. I'm glad there's more than 10 people this morning. But that won't make you grow in itself. It's actually putting your roots down to Jesus. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to church. I encourage you to go to church. I'm a pastor. Please go to church. It's very good. So whatever he does prospers, we'll see there. Now, some teachers in the past have taught the idea of prosper is that you're going to be financially rich. That sounds great. I'd like that. Um, but it's actually not what it's talking about. Looking at the context, it's talking about a tree. And what does a tree do to be prosperous? It grows. It bears fruit. And it's the idea of bearing fruit. So, uh, Galatians, uh, two, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, that's Jesus in our life, is love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness, faithfulness, gentleness. And so when we're in Jesus, these are the fruit. Not our own fruit, but what comes through us. Now, if a person aligns themselves with Jesus, and they have the fruit of God in their life, then obviously that will spill over to the rest of their life. Their relationships at work, the way they handle their finances, the way they do sports, will be enriched. There'll be an element of success because of what God is doing in your life. But it's not guaranteed success, it's overflowed success. There is this beautiful knock-on effect your whole life. If you come to church and you have the fruit of spirit, it should show when you play sports. It should show the way you handle your finances. Um, I was remembering a comment about uh, Ronnie Clark's son when he played his first game of rugby. It was quite interesting. The radio guy said, oh, it's Ronnie Clark's son, he's a Christian. He's really relaxed because he doesn't really like rugby that much. He loves God first. And the way he plays rugby is secondary. And I thought, these are two non-Christian guys commenting about a guy's first game of rugby, and they could see the fruit of the Spirit in this guy's life. And I thought it was really, really cool. Now remember, just because we have the fruit in the Spirit doesn't mean you're going to have a successful life. Look at Jesus. He was betrayed and killed, murdered on a cross. He was betrayed by his disciples. They fled him. He was betrayed by his own country people. He was betrayed by the Jewish teachers, the ones who said, we follow God. And yet he had the perfect fruit. He had love, joy, peace, patience. And so it's not a guarantee for happiness in life. But it will overflow into the other areas of your life. Right, come back to verse 4. The wicked are not so. They're like chaff. And this is the opposite. You'll notice the wisdom. So you've got the tree that has Jesus and grows, and now you have the chaff. Now the chaff is the outside of the grain. It's the bit that is the useless bit, the bit that the farmer doesn't want. And so what often would happen is they beat the, the, the wheat on the ground and then throw it in the air, and the wind would take away the wheat, um, the chaff, and then all the good stuff would fall to the ground. And it talks about being permanent, about being useful. And so the tree is there, it's permanent, will bear fruit. The chaff has got rid of. The chaff is going to be blown away. The consequence of the ungodly life is that it's useless. It's no use to God. And we see in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist talks about Jesus' life and his ministry. That Jesus is going to come with his fork, and he's going to throw the grain into the air, and the chaff is going to be blown away. The righteous will not continue. So we're told in verse 5, The wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The wicked find themselves in a space of being condemned, of not continuing. This is a terrible reality, a terrible position to be in, a not pleasant position for me to talk about. But there is hope in Jesus Christ. All of us were walking down the path of wickedness, and all of us were saved by Jesus' blood, by the redemption work that's in Jesus. And I love that verse in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 21, and 8.1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
When we're in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, which is cool. So it's not our work, it's not our effort, it's about what God puts in our life. And once God's in our life, then we want to serve him. There is effort, there is um, there's enjoyment about going to church, there's enjoyment about reading our Bible. Right, let's move on to the third description of the joyful person. And the third description is their certainty. The happy person has confidence. Once again, we can see the contrast. If you have counsel of corrupt, then you don't continue. If you have the creator, you do continue. And there's a certainty because you have this coach, you have God in your life. It says, the Lord knows you. Now, obviously, the Lord knows the wicked as well. But here in this text, it says, the Lord knows you, meaning it's a personal relationship. We have a personal relationship with God, which is a huge difference from the wicked person who doesn't have that companionship. We know Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of shadows of death, you what? You are with me. So we have God with us, this concept. And so there's a difference between these two. So in many ways, we're talking about an uncomfortable topic. We're putting people into two categories. And that's not a very nice thing to do, Hayden. I'm here. It's summertime. Give me a happy sermon. Tell me how I'm going to do financially this year. Let's be happy. But it's quite serious because there's two camps. There's two types of counsel, two consequences, two certainties. And you're telling someone they've got no certainty. Maybe next time you meet someone, they're talking about life. Ask them, do you have a certainty? What's going to happen to you afterwards? And they, they don't have a certainty. Without Jesus, there is no certainty. If you talk to most religious people, their teachings tell them there's no certainty. I might be happy on the other side. We have a complete certainty. Now, the key is to apply this wisdom. It is not helpful to go, wow, that's a great sermon, Hayden. Thank you. Now I understand the wisdom. There's two camps. We actually have to apply it. I mentioned earlier the, the wisdom of only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. We know this wisdom. You've heard it. But the crunch comes when we apply it to our life. Only when we apply the wisdom does it actually work in our lives. How many of you have been sunburnt this summer? Wow, there's a lot of hands go up. Okay, you obviously knew nothing about the cruel sun in New Zealand. No one told you the wisdom. No, you knew the wisdom. But you didn't listen to it. And now you pay for it. And you're going to have old, wrinkly, leathery skin. And no one, no, sorry, going there too far. So you know the wisdom. Today, you know the wisdom that God has given us. In Jesus, we have life. Any other pathway, unfortunately, you will perish. Okay? If you go out in the midday sun, you will perish. Particularly me, I'm a white boy. I just go white or red. I never go brown, which is sad. My brother does go brown, which is nice. Okay, so that's the choice before us. So my question to you is, what are you going to do about this information, about this wisdom? It's up to you. It's not up to me. It's not up to your parents. It's not up to your church. It's up to you. Are you going to walk in the wise way or the foolish way? Are you going to go out in the midday sun or are you going to stay at home? Are you going to do slip, slop, slap? Or are you going to don't care? The choice is yours. And the cool thing is, if you come to ABC Church, we're going to encourage you in Jesus, to pursue Jesus, to allow Jesus to live through your life, to radically live what's in the Bible. The scriptures are not out of dated. The way they talk about our relationships, the way we should do our finances, the way we should respond to older or younger people, it's incredible. It's such a blessing to walk in the way of the righteous. It's not a like, oh my gosh, I've got to do what God wants me to do. It's actually a privilege. It's actually exciting. When we can tell the truth to people, there's a freedom, a real freedom. When we do sexuality God's way, there's a freedom. When we do business God's way, there's a freedom. They say there's a freedom the other way. There's no freedom in lying. There's no freedom in cheating. All right. The worship team's going to come up and uh, lead us in our final song to respond. Although the last two songs we did earlier, they both talk about this life that we have, which is really cool. You could talk about any of those. We could repeat those songs as too. So I'm going to pray, and Emily and her wonderful team are going to come and serve us. Father, I thank you that we know this wisdom, that we have amazing life in Jesus. At the same time, Lord, we sometimes go out in the midday sun without sun cream, and we just don't care. Lord, I pray today we'll make a decision for this year to live wisely. Uh, to, to read our Bible, to follow your ways, Lord, to have a relationship with you. 
Lord, we've all made mistakes. I've made mistakes, Lord. I've got some burnt. But Lord, this year I pray that we would deepen our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that more areas of our life would be in the counsel of God. And we walk away from the counsel of the corrupt. Lord, I pray that our lives would become order. And we would avoid the chaos that just seeks to destroy us. Thank you that Jesus died on a cross to redeem my life, to bring me back into relationship with you, Lord. Thank you that it's not my effort, but now that I can live, I can walk because I have Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks, Hayden. Um, we're going to...